Hello everyone and welcome to our discussion with Raffaello D'Andrea who we're delighted to have joining us today from Zurich. I'm Richard Lightbound from Robo Global in London. I'm going to give some very quick introductory remarks before we actually kick off with Raf. Raf's actually kindly joined us many times on the stage and more recently it's also been the, the virtual stage and as you hear, he is deeply entrenched in the world of robotics and AI as, a, as an entrepreneur, as an industry expert, as a new media artist, and also as a professor at ETR Zurich. Um, prior to Raf's current venture, which is called Verity, he co-founded warehouse automation company Kiva Systems that was acquired by Amazon in 2012, later rebranded as Amazon Robotics. In 2020, RAF was inducted into the National um, Inventors Hall of Fame and was elected to the US National Academy of Engineering. I can go on, but as you can hear, we're in very good hands with RAF today. In terms of Robo Global, RAF's actually a co-founder of Robo Global. He's a, a key member of our strategic advisory board. We actually established our company Robo Global in 2013 as a research advisory and index company focused on disruptive innovation investment opportunities really where we can capture long-term growth opportunities that benefit not just investors but society as well and obviously that's the, the focus of today's discussion and also where we can see a significant universe of high quality companies where we can engage with their, their management teams we score the companies across various filters, including our ESG policy. You can see on the left-hand side of this slide here, we've tackled three disruptive tech themes to, to date. Um, those are robotics and automation, or robo, artificial intelligence, or think, THNQ, or our healthcare tech and innovation strategy, um, HTech. So these three strategies are available as research indices. You can see here the past 12 performance of each. And I just want to emphasize that that past 12 months of performance comes from a very diversified portfolio. We've got about 80 companies in each of the strategies and you'll then see ETFs and funds in the US, Europe and Asia that track these indices and overall assets in the region of about 4 billion US dollars. Second slide here, you can see the advisory board that we have at Robo Global. This obviously includes RAF. Their expertise and guidance is, is really important to our research team and, and process. They give us very important insights into innovation, both in terms of what, how it's going to impact investors again, as well as society. And then if we just look at the, the next slide, you can see our Robo Index. This was the world's first robotics and automation investment strategy. To date, we've got 11 targeted subsectors. And you can see since inception um, seven years ago, you can see the performance across each of the subsectors. Logistics automation is by far the top performing subsector. It's at plus 500 percent. So clearly, this is a, a subsector that's benefited our investors. And while some of the benefits to society are obvious, others are not. So, Raf, again, welcome. And it'd be great if you can just walk us through your Kiva and Verity journey, share some of your thoughts about environmental and societal benefits within warehouses and, and the retail supply chain. Sure. Um, I mean, there's a lot, obviously, to talk about. Um, uh, you know, when we started Kiva back in, you know, 2003, uh, this was something that no one was really talking about. I mean, uh, it was just not on the radar, really, of most, uh, most investors, most companies. Um, uh, and, you know, there's a natural uh, combination between robotics and automation and, uh, you know, being, uh, being responsible in terms of the environment. So the, you know, the E in ESG and that is just simply because of the reduction of waste, the redu uh, doing things much more efficiently. Our Kiva robots would use roughly 25 cents of electricity per day. So to run a robot for one day, 24 seven, uh, 24 hours uh, all the time would be you know, 25 cents per day. 
Um, that is incredibly efficient in terms of uh, being able to move things around in a warehouse to do things to do that comparably with with other means uh, is significantly worse. Um, so not only does it make economic sense, uh, but at the time it also was great for the environment, uh, just simply because you're not using um, you're not using a lot of uh, electricity, and of course at the time a lot of fossil fuels were were being used to do that. You know, with Verity, we're seeing a similar thing. Um, you know, we we have a system that we developed that uh, does automated inventory. Uh, that's the, the it also does things like inspection. Um, uh, but our initial deployments uh, with our two clients, IKEA uh, and DSV, are around inventory management. And uh, and there, you know, the the uh, the benefits are again not just economical benefits. Um, they come from uh, reduction of waste. Uh, so in particular, we, we enable our clients to, to reach what we call a, the zero error warehouse. So the ability to go from the median error in a warehouse in terms of keeping track of where their things, things are of say 98%, um, yeah, there's a 2% error, uh, the median error. That sound, doesn't sound like a lot, but when, you're, you, know, when you have uh, 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 tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars of inventory in some of these huge facilities, that amounts to quite a bit. So, you know, there's huge cost savings uh, that the clients get from using our system like ours. They don't have to put people at heights, which is dangerous. Um, uh, the drone solution can do it much more efficiently. It's fully autonomous, right? There's no one controlling the drones. They, in their own, figure out where to go, what information needs to be collected, synchronized with the client's warehouse management system in the background. So there's huge benefits for the client. But what's also amazing is that a system like this can have a huge impact in CO2 emissions, and mainly because of the reduction in waste. You go from 98% accuracy to 100% accuracy, that impact of that 2% is tremendous uh, in terms of CO2 savings. Well, we just uh, wrote a white paper recently on you know, the effects on a warehouse, on a large warehouse, a million square feet. The savings uh, can amount to something like taking 5,000 cars off the road for a year. So the, the environmental impact uh, of deploying this autonomous technology is not just about doing it more effectively, doing it uh, cost cutting. Um, uh, it's also the impact that you get when you can do it much more accurately, you can do it much more often, much more efficiently, uh, and, and all the savings that you get from that. Yeah, Raf, thank you. Really interesting. And, you know, also you've got some, you know, great data points there. And, you know, we're certainly seeing that coming through with a, a lot of other companies that, you know, we, we, we talk to that they're moving away from, you know, almost more sort of fluffy, perhaps ESG type policies, but really trying to articulate with some hard data, the sort of the, the impact that their businesses have, have on the, the environment and society in a, in a positive way. Really easy example is, is someone like uh, Adobe. We, we actually have scored them very high in terms of uh, the E in ESG, but they say that for every 1 million transactions completed via Adobe Sign versus paper workflows, it saves over 27 million gallons of water, 1.5 million pounds of waste, and about 23.4 million pounds of, of CO2 emissions. So, I'd imagine, Raf, as, as you're discussing Verity solutions with, with new clients, it, this must be a sort of a major talking point, almost something you're, you're often always leading with. Um, it's, it, it absolutely is. Uh, and it's interesting because it's, it, it is absolutely on the radar of upper management, uh, the folks that are running the company. Um, uh, and that was a little bit surprising to us how the, you know, so the first discussions uh, really around, yeah, it's great, it saves us money. If you talk, the higher up you go, then this question comes up. Well, can you tell us, you know, uh, how, how your technology improves the environment? Um, and why is that? Um, it's, it's actually pretty straightforward to, you know, to answer this. You say, well, you know, wh why are companies so enamored with ESG? Um, uh, and let's look at uh, environmental. Um, it's, you know, there's these companies, especially tech companies, they have so much cash. What do they do with this cash? You know, they could park it in Switzerland where they can make minus 0.75% interest, or what they can do is they can invest it in the future. They can invest it in the future of the company and they see the trends, they know where things are going. Uh, and, you know, the consumers of tomorrow are the young people of today and the young people are today are completely lined up with 
with uh, environmental uh, and social issues. Uh, so it is, uh, you know, it's self-serving. You, you may say, well, you know, they're being altruistic. Well, actually, a lot of the founders are. I mean, no better example than, than Bill Gates, who's devoted a huge part of his life to making the world a better place. But it's also self-serving. They know that in a world where, you know, the consumer, the consumers of tomorrow are these young folks that really care about these issues that will shop, you know, with, with, with their ideals, but also the talent. Uh, these tech companies, they're scrambling to get the best talent. There's a shortage of talent uh, uh, in engineering, um, robotics, AI, computer science. And they know that if they have a company culture where they care about the environment, they're going to do better at recruiting. So it's it's like a it's like a no brainer for them to do these sort of things. Uh, just a little anecdote, you know, at Verity, um, you know, the average age of our company is uh, is 32, 33. We're a 60 person company, uh, and uh, you know, these issues are, are are at the forefront of what they think of thinking about. I. I had lunch, uh, um, you know, this was pre-COVID, you know, uh, I, I was having lunch in the in the common room there and then I go to wash my dish and, uh, you know, one of the, uh, the young folks there comes up to me and says, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm just washing my dish because the dishwasher is full. And she goes, no, 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 just take your dish, put it on the side and wait for the dishwasher to be done because it's, you're wasting so much water by washing your dish by hand, you know, just wait until it's done and then uh, and then you can use a dishwasher. Uh, she had no problem, you know, with I'm the CEO of the company, the founder, she had no problem just going, what are you doing? Like, are you stupid or something? You shouldn't be doing that. Now, in all fairness, in that particular instance, uh, you know, I did end up washing the dish with my hand because I just had sardines. And I thought it was best for the welfare of the company that I did uh, wash the dish and she understood that. So this is at the forefront of young people that they care about these things. And it makes perfect sense for companies to do this. Yeah, no, that, that, that's interesting. And I know we've talked in the past, Raf, just about attracting talent, keep, keeping talent in, in organizations. It, it's actually a big part of our AI um, index scoring process. So we do talk to you know, the, the management teams at companies an awful lot about it. I know you're busy with Rarity at the moment recruiting as, as well. And I think, as you say, there's, there is absolutely this, this dramatic shift in terms of attitudes and, and tolerances, you know, with this sort of the the millennials and the perhaps of generations um, either side in terms of their, their willingness to come and join companies that aren't sort of e ESG friendly. That's correct. They have uh, they have many choices available to them, and what makes their decision many times are these secondary, you know, secondary uh, what we would call secondary um, benefits. But actually, for them, it's it's you know it's it's in line with what kind of job am I going to be doing? Am I going to like it? And uh, is my company doing the right thing? That is you know. Th that is uh, right up front with, um, you know, uh, with their decision making and yeah. and retention. Yeah, no, no, we're almost seeing it as some of our index companies that are using it almost as, as a hook to actually get people in to, you know, really put progress their, their ESG policy. Um, do, just in terms of Robo Global's e ESG policy, we, we actually expanded it quite considerably in, in 2017. We became a, a signatory to UN Pre. We're, we're also aligned with the, the 10 principles under the UN Global Compact. And we actually evaluate companies in, in our universe really using a combination of the, the, the internal re research, our regular interaction with the management teams. We also outsource some, some data to, to leading providers um, like Sustain Analytics. But I, th I think what's really important to, to highlight is as you look across our three strategies, so Robo, Think, and HTech, they really tend to, to lean very naturally towards companies making um, active efforts to deliver positive ESG outcomes, really because automation, technology, um, it's largely about increasing efficiency, product productivity, it's about lowering the environmental impact, really freeing up time for us as humans to you know, focus on things that we're, we're frankly be better at, at doing. And I, I just want to highlight a pretty interesting company. It's actually in our AI strategy. It's Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company. And in our um, investment research, we rank them very highly in terms of market leadership and tech leadership. 
We also actually rank them very highly right across the E, the S and the G, which for a, a semiconductor manufacturer in, in Asia is perhaps a, a little bit of a, a surprise. But ju just in terms of you know, very brief highlights why, um, semiconductor manufacturers um, have exposure to, to conflict materials and it can be a, a real risk if, if they do. So TSMC only purchase raw materials from smelters that are certified as conflict free. They have a, a very strong track record in terms of employee treatment and safety. They've got very strong disclosure around the company diversity. In 2019, their waste recycling rate climbed to 20, sorry, 96%. And in 2019, their average monthly salary of direct labor in their Taiwan facilities was actually three times the minimum av average wage in, in Taiwan. So, Raf, as, as we sort of look broadly across our, our sort of universe of, of companies that we, we cover, as we're saying, we're seeing this real shift from simple ESG policies to you know, much more impactful actions, real hard targets. We're seeing real job postings for dedicated ESG resources as, as well. But you know, do you have any views? Is this happening more around the environmental topics? I mean, does social and governance need to, to catch up a little bit here? Yeah, I mean, I, again, I think the reason you're seeing these tech companies be the leads is because they are used to thinking about moving fast and employing best practices. And it is completely well understood by now that diversity is a huge strength. Uh, the more diversity you have in your team, the stronger of a team you have. You know, I, I bring again our company Verity, where, you know, we're 65 people. We have uh, 22 nationalities within our company. Uh, everyone in our company, everyone speaks at least two languages. Many speak three. Uh, it is just a strength that um, uh, for problem solving, for uh, uh, for cohesion, um, it's it's huge. Our you know our head of engineering is female. Our head of legal is female. Our head of manufacturing is legal. Our head of HR is legal. Um, you know, there's some companies uh, the, that are, you know, that strive to have, you know, uh, uh, equal representation uh, from, uh, you, you know, uh, reflected in their employment. Uh, that's a strength. It is, it is absolutely a strength to have this diversity. It is not just about doing the right thing. Uh, it is not just about, you know, when people ask you or your kids ask you, you know, it's like, uh, well, who works at your company, you know, so to do the right thing, but it, 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 it's just perfectly aligned with running a better business. Yeah, and, and just, I don't know if you'd agree here, Raf, something that we've really noticed in discussions with, with companies is just, you know, through through the pandemic, you know, they've, um, it's really allowed the, the work from home an opportunity to hire people from very different backgrounds, as you're saying, different skill sets, diff different countries so i think there is going to be a real sort of you know catch up if you will in terms of in terms of social you know for the rest of this year and, and next year around the diversity that, that's a great example of verity yeah and, and i think um you know and again i go back to um these companies that are the ones that are growing quickly um these tech companies these companies that embrace technology um, you know, uh, it is not a coincidence that they have a lot of young people, uh, smart, dedicated young people working uh, in these companies, and they want this diversity. They want diversity of experience. Uh, uh, you know, they want their colleagues to come from different backgrounds. They don't want people to be just like them. Um, this is why young people love to travel when they're young, right? This is, this is just aligned with, with, with who they are. So I think companies that facilitate that will do a better job of recruiting, they will have do a better job of retention and they will make their employees more productive and they will do better in the markets. Yeah, no, we, we agree. It's interesting. Um, so I just want to go back to the, the robo global ESG policy. I mean, this is very much something that's been evolving over time. As you look at the policy right now, we very specifically exclude companies where there might be um, and any sort of violation of human rights, um, any severe environmental damage that's being caused, um, any real sort of violations of fundamental ethical norms. We also have no direct exposure to, to fossil fuels or, or tobacco. But the, the, the point I'm trying to get to here almost is that actually measuring and benchmarking the E, the S and the G across companies 
it's it's a it is a challenge and opinions differ significantly in the market you know we we have our own view on companies as i said we source external data as well and that there are often vast vast differences i think what's really important for us is as part of our process um um researching the companies um anyway we have a very strong relationship with the management teams we've got good relationship to, to the management teams at the index members so we, we, we feel pretty well positioned to actually, you know, really dr drill deeper and deeper into um, ESG aspects. And I think uh, I, I can imagine that, you know, because you guys, because uh, I don't do this, uh, um, you know, Richard and his team uh, uh, do this. Uh, I think these companies get a lot of benefit from, you know, engaging in conversations because they can hear about other best practices. Uh, and, you know, as this is still relatively speaking in its infancy, like 50 years ago. Like if if you could tell someone, forget about 50, 20 years ago, this is the discussions CEOs are having. They would just wouldn't believe you. So it's still in its infancy. So there's a lot of best practices that need to be developed. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. As I said, there are sort of you know huge differences with you know opinions and and, and data and, and views of uh, different companies. Um, Raf, if you don't mind, I was just going to change the topic um, a, a little bit. Um, you know, recently, I think we were exchanging an article that was talking about US GDP is now back to pre pandemic levels. And I think what was really interesting is it was saying that, you know, we've got there, or the US has got there with only 95% of the workforce at the peak. And that, and it, that obviously really implies a, a productivity re revolution. So just kind of interested in, in your, your thoughts there, kind of, you know, what's happening? Is, it, is that a trend that's going to continue? And then also, I know we're going to get a question from the audience about the impact of robotics and AI on, on the labor market. So perhaps we could just tackle that one now as well. Yes, I mean, um, for folks that say that, you know, robots and automation don't take jobs away, they're lying. Robots and automation do take jobs. What is true, however, is that they also create jobs. So the, the question, I mean, uh, 100 years ago, 100. 30 years ago, um, the statistics, I believe, is that 98% of, of the US population was engaged in agriculture of some sort, right? Uh, and over time, obviously, we've gone from that 98% to something that is probably significantly less than 1% uh, direct in, in agriculture. So th this is inevitable. Uh, it's a good thing. Quality of life has improved. Um, I think from a societal perspective, we just need to make sure that we handle these transients properly from a, from a governance, and I don't mean corporate governance, which is what the seminar is about, but actually from the country's governance is that we enable um, this transition to happen as smoothly as possible. Um, uh, you know, uh, when, uh, when, the race, uh, when the pace of development of growth is fast, you can't just rely on retirements to naturally handle this displacement. You have to be a little bit more proactive, such as retraining, uh, such as uh, allowing folks to, you know, to have more than one career in their life. I think a big part of this productivity game, uh, alluding to what you said uh, earlier, uh, you know, I think we still need to wait it out a little bit, but I think a clear part of it is just simply uh, people being able to work from home. Um, uh, uh, you know, when you don't have to spend, especially, you know, here in Europe, uh, in Switzerland in particular, it is extremely unusual to live more than 30 minutes from the place that you work. But of course, in Canada and the United States, it's not unheard of for people to travel an hour and 15 minutes each way to go to work. Think of the lost productivity um, in doing that. Uh, think of the environmental impact uh, uh, of, of having uh, cars on the road to do that. You're, you're making your employers much more, much happier by giving them the ability to work from home. They're gonna be more productive uh, because there's less hours that they're spending doing tasks that don't add value. Um, and, uh, you know, that just, it makes people more productive in the obvious way. It makes them more productive because they're happier. So I think, I think a part of that is definitely that. Yeah, no, th thank you. Um, let, let me just highlight a couple of companies that, that are in our strategies, just in terms of e ESG observations. So the, the first one is Autodesk. They're actually in our Robo and Think strategy. Um, we rank them very highly in terms of E, quick examples, why they're actually powering um, all of their buildings, data centers and cloud services now using 100% renewable energy. They've reduced their greenhouse gas emissions by 43% since 2009, and they've clocked up over 27,000 hours of employee 
volunteering time. Um, another company is Trimble. They sit just in our robo strategy. It's a bit of a model company, almost across the E, the S, and the G. Just quick examples, quick highlights. 14% of their annual revenue is reinvested in developing new technologies. Solutions with Trimble across construction, agriculture, and transportation have displayed a, a reduction of 19 billion pounds of CO2 compared to solutions without Trimble. And they only establish relationships with third party partners who share their commitment to conducting business fairly, legally, ethically, and transparently. So I kind of picked the, these two graphs because they're, they're a little bit lower on the market cap spectrum in, in, in our strategies. Robo and, and the healthcare strategy actually both have a bit of a tilt to small and mid cap companies anyway. But certainly when we look at our artificial intelligence strategy, we start to see a lot more of the, the, the larger cap type companies. And I was just interested if, if you had a view, you know, are, are the, the larger companies do, doing enough here today? Or are we seeing a lot of these sort of, you know, perhaps, you know, small and mid market companies really sort of moving, moving faster? I think that um, uh, it's obviously easier for a smaller company to, um, there's a sweet spot, right? If you're too small, you know, you don't have the luxury of, uh, of uh, you know, you're just trying to stay alive and grow. If you're, if you're too big of a company, you know, there's processes in place. So I think these mid cap companies, it's not surprising that they, that they can lead the way, especially when they have the right leadership. I think what all of these companies share um, is uh, for the most part um, is their high margin businesses. So they actually have the ability to invest, invest in the future. It's a great luxury to have. And, you know, this goes back to the point we said earlier, this is great investment in the future. Uh, just, the, just the employee retention alone, just being able to attract the best talent, that's a great return of investment. What else are they going to do with their capital? Um, so th that is, you know, uh, it pays, that alone pays for itself, but also being able to you know, to work with clients and clients can then downstream can say, you know, uh, well, we work with these folks and look at their stellar record. It kind of shines, you know, a little bit of rubs off on them. And of course, they have their own employees that like to hear these sorts of things. So it's just really good business. Uh, and it makes sense for these mid cap companies to be leading the way. Great. Th thank you. Um, and Rafa, earlier we were talking just within logistics automation, perhaps some of the, the more sort of, you know, hidden benefits towards the environment and, and society of ro robotics and AI. If we, if we just look more broadly at some of the sort of the big macro challenges facing society, and I, you know, we talk about a lot of these in our discussions with, with investors, but things like feeding the world's pop population, improving healthcare systems, Care, caring for, for the elderly. Just, just how important is the role of disruptive tech and innovation in terms of addressing big social challenges like that? I mean, technology is a tool, right? At the end of the day, that's what it is. It's, it's a wonderful tool that, uh, that is unique to our, to our species. Um, and, uh, you know, tools can be used for good, tools can be used for bad. Uh, and the more powerful the tool, the more potential it has for good and for bad. Um, the, the potential use for good is, is incredible. There's a, you know, there's a, uh, in, in the robotics world, uh, we always talk about the three Ds of, of, of robotics, and that is things that are dull, dirty, or dangerous. Um, this is what robotics and automation are great for, um, is to get rid of uh, dull tasks, and that's a service to people. Um, you know, you could argue that, um, uh, you know, when I used to live in Boston, there were folks that would spend their whole lives at the booth, you know, giving you a ticket, taking money and giving you change. 30, 40 years of their life doing this, um, you know, you gotta automate those jobs. Uh, you, you can't let people, it's, it's, it's inhumane to have people do those jobs. Now that doesn't mean of course that they're better off on welfare. And again, this is that retraining part. But the point being is that these are super dull jobs that, that really shouldn't exist. D dangerous jobs, you know, if we can use automation to replace dangerous jobs, we absolutely should be doing that. I go back to our warehouse uh, inventory solution. You know, these folks are, some of these folks are going up at 35, 40 feet uh, with, uh, with lifting devices, forklifts, you know, doing scanning. These are dangerous tasks. Um, they're very careful, right? So they, you know, so the injuries are kept low. Uh, if there is an injury, it's usually, it's usually a fatality. Um, uh, but it's a very uh, nerve wracking task when you're at that height and always being careful uh, about your safety. So 
there's huge impact there. Um, you know, caring for the elderly. Uh, I'm not a big fan of removing people completely from these tasks because people need a human touch. You know, so uh, maybe I'm not a big fan of kind of the, you know, the, uh, the, the uh, Japanese style of here, here's a, here's a little robot seal and, and now you don't need a pet anymore. No, I, I'm a big fan of having, you know, cats and, you know, of course you can have allergies, et cetera, but, uh, you know, having real physical contact with things. Having said that, there's just a lot of tasks, especially when it comes to the elderly that can be facilitated if you have uh, robotics and automation just to be to you know there aren't enough people to do these tasks right so you do need the help of uh, of automation to uh, you know uh, to to make the uh, to address the, the labor shortage to do these tasks yeah and well, one question we get asked a, a lot raf is you know across our three strategies so robotics and automation artificial intelligence and then healthcare tech and innovation you know, which has got the biggest, you know, obvious benefits to, to, to society. And, you know, it is, it's a difficult question to, to respond to, but I, I think we tend to swing towards our healthcare tech and in innovation strategy. Um, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a very broad set of, of technologies. It's tackling a lot of the, the challenges that we have in, in the healthcare system today. We really, you know, um, trying to invest into to themes around shifting from a, a system where we literally wait for people to get sick and then we then spend a, an awful lot of money actually treating them. We've got the, the capabilities now to, you know, detect signs of disease and, and cancer, but very, very early. We've got customized treatment plans that we can start to, to build for individuals. And it's really a whole series of technologies that essentially is going to drive a, a better patient outcome. It's going to, you know, allow doctors and nurses to spend more time with patients rather than on sort of non-value-added type tasks and, and really create a, a better healthcare system. So, you know, we, we see a lot of, you know, obvious um, benefits to, to society there. But just wondering if you've got any, any thoughts about what, what's happening with, with um, technology and innovation in, in the healthcare industry. So, um, you know, I think those are, those are direct benefits uh, that, uh, as you said, are the most tangible ones. You think, you know, uh, impact on, especially people, right? Because th let's be clear, this is really only geared towards people. Uh, the environment is much broader than just human beings. So uh, I think, you know, you have to have a broad perspective. Um, you know, there's just so much data that's out there that can be leveraged to improve the way that we do medicine. Uh, and we are doing that. Um, it's not easy. Uh, there's so much variety. There's so much, you know, between people, the, 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 the variances are quite large. So you, you need a lot of data, but you also need models uh, that take into account the differences between people so that you don't just rely on data. You do need models. So there's a lot of nice combination of science, uh, uh, fundamental science, uh, with big data sciences, marrying those together to improve, um, you know, to improve processes. I had a, um, again, as an anecdote, um, uh, uh, I'm perfectly healthy, but I have a funny, funny heart murmur, right? So um, every three years, I have to get a, you know, uh, a cardiogram to make sure that it's not getting any worse. So I'm talking to my doctor and, uh, you know, he's showing me his new machine that he just got. And it was, you know, like orders of magnitude better than his old one. It takes a long time to, you know, to make these machines, not from a technological perspective, but just the approval. Uh, and, uh, you know, he was able to perform that task so much faster than he could before. Uh, you know, it was, it, was, it was great being there just to see. He was like a kid in a toy store, right? Like he was showing me because he knew that I have an engineering background. So he was saying, look at this, look what I can do here and the volume and stuff like that. So um, it just allows these folks to, to make better decisions, to catch their mistakes. Um, people welcome uh, this technology. I, I mean, I think, I think all of the impact is positive. Great, thank you. Um, Raph, I'm just going to dip into a couple of the, the audience questions that, that are coming in here. There's, there's one here I can't, I can't resist, but I think it's going back to where we started when we were looking at the robotics and automation strategy. And over the, the past seven years, our, our top performing subsector being logistics or automation. But it, it's asking if, if we're surprised. I, I, I think what they're getting at is obviously we've got a lot of technology in the robotics and automation strategy as well. We've got a sensing subsector. We've got a computing and AI subsector, but 
that you know by far the top performing subsector was logistics or, or automation. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's it's always easy to not be surprised in hindsight. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, but you know, uh, again, uh, uh, in hindsight, it is not surprising. In foresight, it wasn't either because we obviously included it in you know. A, and me personally, I'm, I'm engaged in the space, but it's not surprising because the, you know, a lot of economic activity revolves around making stuff now, right? Uh, and, um, uh, and there's just a lot of low hanging fruit there. When we started Kiva in 2003, the original name of the company was Disrobot. And, you know, we were talking to potential uh, investors and they just said to us, you got to get rid of that word robot um, because, uh, you know, people, do you want to be taken seriously by your clients? You can't have the word robot. Uh, you need to talk about something else. So we, we came up with this name Kiva, which, you know, to most people means nothing. And that was, that was, that was the point. Uh, means meeting place, by the way. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, there just was no penetration of anything remotely like this. Of, I mean, we didn't invent AGVs. Uh, but we certainly invented having warehouses that had a thousand of them running 24 uh, seven. Right. And this would, you know, was science fiction to folks. All to say is that the penetration of automation uh, today is extremely small, right? There is so much uh, uh, more that can be done. There was a recent study. I think it was, uh, it was uh, BCG. Uh, uh, something like 95% uh, of all warehouses have, little to no automation in them. We're just at the beginning. And of course, in 2013, when we started Robo, we were even more in the beginning. Uh, and I predict that we will always be in the beginning. It's just a something that we're just starting this, th this process, this ability to think about this. I mean, this is, this is magic, right? We have an ability to create an artificial feedback loop that senses information decides what to do and actuates upon it without people in the loop. This has only been possible recently and it's so powerful. It's not just about software, right? Uh, you know, everybody was talking about the software uh, revolution, but software did not have this ability to close the loop. Software was presenting data to people in a more efficient way. Uh, you know, the first ki the killer app uh, of, of personal computers was Excel and Word, right? Still people. This ability to close this loop is, is just happening now and we're at its infancy so it's not surprising that that it has led the way and i believe that it will continue to be a high performing sector for the next 20 30 50 years yeah no, that, that's great i think some really good messages in that raf just for investors to to hear and you know as we look across the the 11 subsectors that, that are in robo and we've got the same the same approach with the, the other two um themes as, as well. But, you know, each of the subsectors is, is there to really give investors very deliberate, broad, diversified exposure to, to the theme. And we just fundamentally think it's it's too early to be thinking about picking the winners. Now, I think this is a great, a great example, as you say, seven years ago, when we put Robo in into the market, who would have thought in seven years time that logistics automation would be pretty much double every other subsector that we, we've got there. It really plays to this, this idea that you want broad, diversified exposure. That's correct. And, you know, and, and in, in retrospect, it's always easy to point the flaws. And this is the, this is the important part. It's not that you shouldn't do retrospectives. It's that you should try to understand why did I make the wrong decision so that you don't repeat that mistake. You know, you could argue, well, you know, 3D printing, you know, minus 30%, right? That's the performance of that sector. Um, hey, you know, there's going to be some winners and losers. And there's a lot of people, us included, that thought that 3D printing would, you know, uh, have a big impact. And it will, actually. It will have a big impact, impact just like the internet uh, has had a tremendous impact. It's just that it had a false start. Uh, I think 3D printing has had a false start. Okay. Okay. Um but Raph, there's a question here just about different regions, different countries. You know, do, do we see any, any particular, you know, geographies leading in terms of ESG? That's a very good question. Um, I think it's fair to say that, um, you know, the, the regions that I'm most familiar with, of course, are North America and Europe. I think um, uh, a lot of the leadership in North America comes from uh, the private sector. 
And a lot of leadership here in Europe comes from governments. Uh, and um, uh, I think that is, a, you know, I'm not a big government person, but I do believe that governments providing subsidies to start industries is a great thing. Um, like Germany did with, uh, you know, with solar power. Of course, you could argue that their execution maybe was not great and it distorted the market. I mean, that's, that's fine, but the, the intent was there. Um, I think that uh, there is more of an expectation here in Europe that the government should lead the way. And here in Switzerland, uh, that is absolutely the case and, it's, and it fits well. In the United States, it seems that the private sector, uh, the leadership is there, uh, also from cities, right? Not even necessarily state, states or federal governments, but cities are the ones that are taking the lead. It's just a different model. Um, I think it's happening globally. I think everyone is realizing that this is important, that this is what the next generation consumers care about and what the next generation employees care about. And therefore, because of the global situation we live in and because it is easier for people to work remotely, I don't think it's tied to any specific region. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, We've got a question here. It's outside of robots and factories. What areas do you see robots having a positive impact on, on the environment? You know, I, I think for us, Raph, you know, the, the obvious subsector that we would point to in robotics and automation is, is food and ag. There's a lot of, you know, very, you know, positive developments there. In terms of the public sector, it's still, you know, a relatively young subsector for us, but there's an awful lot of activity in the private sector. There's a lot of interesting company, um, sorry, companies coming into uh, into the pub public space as a lot of M&A activity. But really, you know, the big theme now, we see it with companies like um, Deer, you know, it, it's all about giving farmers the, 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 the technology and the AI so that they can get more productivity out of their land with less fertilizer, less waters, you know, clearly a significant uh, benefit to, to the environment there. But just wonder if you've got any, any additional comments there uh, well, you know, uh, it's interesting, uh, maybe just a simple anecdote is, uh, you know, car sharing, um, you know, actually car sharing uh, makes things worse than uh, in the short term than, than you would think, because now you have all of these folks that are just driving cars all the time, driving people around from point A to point B, and people, people before COVID, they would just use this service more because it was so convenient to use. To me, the big disruption will happen is when you have autonomous cars, because then you no longer have to, you know, have uh, 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 move the car by a person from point A to point B. Just this will be done automatically. You can uh, much more effectively uh, use the resources that are available. You can um, uh, you can actually combine rights together. There will be, uh, you know, I think that our love with the automobile is. Uh, you know, it'll take a long time before we go away, but I think we will, in the future, we will view this just as a means of getting around and we won't be so tied to the car. There'll still be racetracks. And that's where I think the love will migrate is people that want to drive the car. They just won't do it on the freeway. They'll just go somewhere else and do it. Uh, so I think that will have a huge societal impact. Self-driving cars will have a huge societal impact. Um, it's completely early days. It's going to take a while before these get deployed. Yeah, th thank you. Um, I think this one's probably for me, Raf. It's a, a question about within our ESG policy if we've ever actually excluded companies from the strategies. The, the answer is is yes, we have. Um, probably most recent example is um, Heek Vision in China. Um, they actually got removed in 2020 because of human rights violations over um, Be 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 Beijing's um, repression of Muslim minorities up in the, the northwest of China. And we, we have a number of other examples as well. So yeah, our, our ESG policies are, are very much active in that, um, that respect. Um, look, Raf, I, I think we've, we've got a few other questions, but we'll, we'll get back to those people um, d directly. I think that was you know, really, really interesting. It's you know, clearly a topic that is just you know, gathering momentum. We talk about ESG at every single investor meeting that we have at the moment in, in Europe. It's gone from being a sort of a, a nice to have theme to really a, you know, a must have in, you know, in, in our um, investment process. So we spend a lot of time on it. I know we're going to continue to be talking to you about it and, and getting your guidance. But thank you very much for sharing some of your thoughts with us today. 
Yeah, I mean, if I have uh, you know, uh, 30 seconds or 20 seconds, just say one thing. Um, you know, what a great time to be an investor, right? You can deploy capital to you know, increase, increase that, to, to get great returns, and you can be doing the right thing. This is wonderful. Great, great. And if, if anyone's interested in just um, receiving our updates, our uh, white papers, quarterly reviews, we do put out a bi-weekly newsletter. You can sign up for it at our website or drop us an email and we will add you in. All of the content, I should say, for those new newsletters comes very much internally. So it's from our research team and also from our advisors, including Raf, who's put out a couple of recent articles, actually. But Raf, thank you very much and look forward to seeing you soon, hopefully in person. Yes, thanks, Richard. Uh, looking forward to coming over and we can go swimming in the pool. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Take care.